So hello everyone and um, welcome to the Big Debate Cameroon. Today we are talking about sexual abuse and molestation in minors. Um, the effects of sexual abuse and molestation is far reaching and um, those, who abuse, um, those who experience sexual abuse as children tend to grapple with issues that have bearings on guilt, shame, blame, and because the abuser is hell-bent on covering his or her tracks, it is difficult to intervene. So today we have three guests with us who, will, who are willing to discuss this situation. Um, we have Honoré Fon, who is a project and concept designer and also the author and icon behind um, 1001 reasons a social club based on face based on facebook we also have mani who is a domestic violence advice for based organization um she's of a book that describes her own personal experience in sexual abuse and um she's all an activist raising awareness and impact of um, violence. Ted, um, our third guest is Barista Sen Abeng. She's based in Yale. She's a human rights and um, humanitarian activist and a national coordinator for Chivitas Cameroon. So um, welcome, Honore, welcome, Manny, and welcome, Sen. We're happy to have you on the show. Co-hosting with me tonight is Elizabeth Akaya. I do not need any formal introduction because anyone who's, who's been watching the Big Debate Cameroon knows Eli, a vital member of the team. So thank you very much for coming tonight and we hope to have a very insightful, educative and impactful um, conversation um, tonight. So Eli. Thank you very much, Delphine. Thank you, Honoré, Manny, and Sen for joining us today for this edition of The Big Debate. Um, it's a pleasure to have you all here, and uh, we hope we're going to have a good time uh, discussing this very important topic, which seems to be, um, you know, it's been long overdue, I would say, that way, because it's something that has become, become very prevalent in our society and um, it's just causing so many issues. So let's go ahead and start. And, you know, normally we would start by just defining um, what the, uh, the main topic for the day is, and that is sexual abuse. So I would pick on you, Mrs. Sen, to just give us your definition of sexual abuse. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, with uh, going my way of definition, I'll just do it in a very straightforward manner. Sexual abuse is having sexual intercourse without consent. And to situate it with a topic, it's um, having a sexual relationship with a child. A child is anyone who is below 18. So having sex with someone who is below 18 is having sex with a child who cannot give consent so that's a sexual abuse which is punishable by the law thank you thank you very much there Mrs. Sen. Manny do you have anything to add yes um thank you for having me first of all um I'm very honored to be here uh I agree with um Sen's definition just to add that um sexual abuse is also um any kind of sexual act that is inflicted on anyone, so man, woman, or child, um, without the person's consent. So any kind of sexual act um, whatsoever, even if it's non-contact or with contact. So yes, that's what I would add to that definition. Okay, very good. Did we just lose our brother there? Yes, I, I think like we did. just lose our brother. Lost him. Honore okay. is um, tuning in from Cameroon and um, he's having some network problems. He already said that before. So it's actually used. There's no electricity in Bamenda right now. Wow. He's joining in with the generator. So oh boy. we'll be having an off. Yeah. Mm, okay. 
Which is so oh, sad yeah. because he's a key man in the group and um Yes, yes, and it would be very yeah, nice to get his contribution at every point. Right. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. Whenever, whenever he comes back on, we can always uh, backtrack and, and, and ask him any uh, questions that we think would be uh, pertinent for him to um, mm -hmm. share his mm -hmm. experience or his knowledge about. So let's build a little bit. Let's build on uh, on on the on the topic. And and mind you, for for the sake of our guests and for those who are not aware that this topic or this discussion today is primarily about sexual abuse in minors. So we're gonna leave adults out of the equation or out of the picture as much as possible okay so let's focus on minors but if we start talking about adults then it's just gonna it's it's, it's we're probably just gonna spend the entire afternoon here today mm -hmm. let's yeah let's build up on sexual abuse so i mean we have words that you know some people especially those who are not experts in the field often use words interchangeably right they use sexual abuse there's sexual assault there's sexual harassment and then of course there's rape so if we can, um, and maybe Amani, you want to take on this first and just share your knowledge on what the difference is, what do you think the difference is between sexual abuse and sexual assault, sexual harassment or rape is? Just, just um, a brief. I, I, would say, I would say that um, there's not really much difference between using the words um, sexual abuse or sexual assault or, um, or child, child rape. Um, I think that the difference is uh, the, the slight difference comes when uh, with who we are addressing, because certain times some people decide to use the word uh, sexual abuse in order to make it sound milder than child rape. Um, yes. because rape sounds more forceful and more violent and depending on your audience at the moment then you 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 decide on which one to use it it sort of sugarcoats it and makes it seem milder to swallow um but otherwise i would say that it's it's all the same it's, it's all it all can be used interchangeably really i would say yeah Okay, uh, Honore, thank you for coming back. And I'll just let me just ask you this before my uh, my co-host Delphine takes over here. So we're, we're just talking about uh, the differences. Like my uh, earlier, we have these words that are used interchangeably, right? And depending on who the uh, the person using the word is, it you know it portrays you know, a different picture of, of of the act, right? So we just want to, if you can just share us your um your understanding of the differences between sexual abuse sexual assault sexual harassment rape if, if at all there's any maybe you know there's something we, we don't know but if there are any differences or so just please uh, just share your knowledge about that yeah um hello again to everybody um when it comes to when it comes to terminologies when it comes to these terms and terminologies, yeah, I would love us to, it's good to be able to clarify these uh, terms. I would say that it's a progressive kind of uh, issue about gravity. For example, sexual harassment, to me, is um, putting negative pressure on somebody for sex. But um, at the level where uh, the question is uh, assault, or that means that you have, you have wrongfully engaged a sexual action on that person. And um, uh, the most I can say when it comes to terms about that, that's the most I would like to say. And, but I would like to make a comment here that when it comes to vocabulary about uh, rape, rape, sexual abuse, etc. There is usually a tendency for uh, advocates and for us who are in the campaign to dwell so much on the terms uh, than uh, the issues. Mm -hmm. The definitions are important, quite all right, but I, I usually get worried that sometimes we make it so much of um, a knowledge thing than a, than a community thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, have, uh, I have noticed that a lot of people in the streets, a lot of people in the villages, 
Let us put in the slum of difficulty connecting with us because they start thinking about how to clarify the difficulty. I think we will lose on our way again. Yeah. Okay. Um, if, if you're just joining the show, that was Honore, and um, we'll just add, um, beg you to bear with us because Honore is tuning in from Cameroon. And right now in Bamenda, there's no electricity, so he's actually tuning in with a generator, and um, we'll be having him on and off as the show goes on. So please just bear with us. Okay, then let's, now that we have cleared um, the field on definitions, um, let's move into the greedy of this show, and which is sexual abuse on minors. Mm -hmm. We insist on minors just for today because a lot of stuff has been happening recently, like um, back last month in Yaoundé, um, a six years old girl was raped by a group of four men, adults, they were arrested. Unfortunately, I couldn't, I tried to get information um, how advanced the case is right now, but I couldn't get anything on that. Um, just last week on the 17th of, of June, a five-year-old girl died in, in Sierra Leone. That was also um, raped by, by an adult. And um, there was also this article I read um, last week about 100, about, or more than 100 girls in Ethiopia who have been sexually abused during this whole lockdown period, and mostly by uh, families, and some of them even by their fathers. So, um, Manye, maybe I'll start with you. Um, what age range are children usually at the highest risk um, of being sexually abused? Um, so I don't, I don't really think that there is um, an age range um, at which a child is at most is most at risk of child abuse, because the the, the main risk is being known to the sexual predator. Um, do I wait for it? Okay. So th the main risk is just knowing the sexual predator and that close proximity with them. So in any case, at any age, whether they are a newborn, because we've also heard that p children who are just a few months old are being sexually abused, um, children who are toddlers and preteens and teenagers, all ages, they're all at risk. So I don't believe that there's any specific age um, of, of children who are higher, uh, more high, uh, higher at risk than anyone else. That's my opinion. Uh, I'm saying, do you have any, have you heard of any personal stories of kids, of children that were raped at what age range are they usually? And um, do, do you know of any stories, especially in Cameroon? Um, yes, please. As Manny rightfully said, the age, it really, really has no specificity because you have victims of different ages, but from trend of events recently, it's like it's getting really younger. The victims are becoming very, very young. And this is because it is incest that is more prevailing. And I think with the COVID-19 confinement, lots of incest is taking place now as people are locked up at home and you see these pedret, pedret, pedretos they don't have any age limit. Even babies of as young as two years old, these perpetrators, they have sexual intercourse with them. So it's really something that is very sad, very pathetic. As Manny said, seriously, there is no age range. It's just like, it's getting younger and younger. That is why the whole situation is really disheartening and such programs are very good to create awareness. Mm -hmm. And we have cases in Cameroon, uh, many of them, most of them are unreported reasons we're going to bring out, but the cases are really increasing by the day. Yeah, and definitely with um, this yeah. COVID-19 lockdown, it's not made it, it's made it a lot worse. Um, even here in, in the UK, it's, it's a lot worse. It's uh, the, the numbers of people who have reported 
sexual abuse um, against kids is just skyrocketed. So, um, and yes, as you rightly said, it's, it's family members, it's um, close friends, it's uh, relatives, you know, because um, especially because during the lockdown here, um, there are many people who, as key workers, they had to go to work. So they had no other option but to leave their children in the care of other of neighbors and friends and relatives. Yeah. And so in doing so, you know, these children are exposed to, to sexual abuse and the parents are none the wiser. So it's, it's uh, really uh, something that we have to raise awareness about all over. Okay, let's talk about the grooming process because um, I think most of it just doesn't happen from today to tomorrow, right? Mm -hmm. These perpetrators, they kind of, you know, um, prepare these children um, to, to before the, the ultimate act. Um, mm -hmm. Like I said before, Manny is an um, author of um, Cactus, Cactus in a Calabash, this book right here. Mm -hmm. um, it's about KB. Um, an eight-year-old girl that was raped by um, Yamil Servant at home. Mm -hmm. And uh, Manny herself um, is um, a victim. I can't hear. I think we... Oh, boy, okay. I think we Delphine is encountering some technical difficulties. Are you guys able to hear me? I'm able to hear yes, you clearly. Can you hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, so yeah, let me... I, can barely hear you. I think, well, Honore, I think you have a different problem altogether, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Your problem is multifaceted, you know, so... Okay, so let me just... Uh, I, I think uh, Manny talked, no, Sen talked about incest, mm -hmm. right? You talked about um, a, a, a minors being being abused by their own family members and 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 and, uh, and, and, and things like that. So let's let's talk about the signs and symptoms because sometimes a lot of these cases go unreported and yeah. they get reported after either somebody suspects that something is happening. To the minor, or maybe um, the minor confides in a friend or, or whoever, a pastor and so on. I think we had an incident in the U.S. whereby the minor was abused by the, the, the father, and the minor went and confided, you know, in in her pastor, and then eventually the whole thing was it was exposed. So, what are some of the signs and symptoms of, of kids that are that are abused? Um, okay, I'll go first. Um, so the signs, um, there are there, there are physical signs and they're also unseen signs, so emotional signs and then behavioral signs and symptoms. Uh, so some of the physical signs are um, like you would find that the child has pain, pain in the genitals, pain in the back passage, and sometimes they have discharge uh inside their mouth so they might develop thrush in the mouth on the tongue it, it shows up as as a whitish substance or um, even on examining the child if an examination a physical examination is performed you would notice that the child's genitals are bruised the skin is bruised but yeah. you know most of the time these physical examinations are not even done because you don't even suspect it to begin with and the child showers on their own so it we wouldn't even come up um but also there's uh, usually bleeding or just scarred skin and bruised skin so those are the physical signs when it comes to the other signs which are more behavioral there are things like um an unexplained behavioral change so that the child just becomes withdrawn just suddenly withdrawn or they start having problems with sleeping at night and um, having nightmares or just being scared of people um, or not not wanting to to be around certain people this could be adults or um, or, or other preteens young younger children or children who are older than them or um, just uh, suffering from insomnia and just acting out really. Uh, one of the telltale signs of that is if the child uh, suddenly starts 
acting, um, doing sexual acts with their toys if they're young. They start, you know, acting, doing sexual things with their toys, like sticking things in their mouth in a sexual way. It would make you, it should make you wonder, where did they see that? Especially if you know that in your household, that cannot be is is not done, um, and where would they see it from? They don't have they don't have um, access to those kinds of movies on TV or on phones if they have phones. So uh, those types of things should make you think and wonder what is going on with um, children who are a little bit older. Um, so maybe preteens. Um, one sign could be uh, the if they become withdrawn as well, but also. Um, having, I uh, was starting to talk about some new older friends who you don't know about, or they suddenly bringing home all this money, um, or bringing home gifts with no explanation of where the gifts are from, and um, just being angry, really. So those are some behavioral changes that uh, could could happen. I would say. Yeah, and if and if I can add on that, I think from a little bit of my background. Um, there's also a tendency for kids who have been uh, sexually abused to tend to behave more maturely than their age mates. Like for a 13 year old would, would, would be more attracted to an older guy than you know her classmates, for instance. Of course, at that age they shouldn't be, but if, if it's important that um, you know parents or even social workers or whoever, if you start noticing that a child of a certain age acting more maturely than her age mates, then I think that's something that needs to be addressed or you know, yeah. raise a red flag as to why um, the, the, the child will be, will be acting that way. Uh, Honore, before you go again, let's uh, have you, I don't know if you want to touch again on um, those uh, the differences or we should just carry on, but you know, I think we should just carry on so that we are not pulling. Yeah. Unfortunately, yes. So let's well, just, I, I have to, uh, yeah, let's, let's yeah let's let's talk about these uh, signs and symptoms because I think that's yes. one of the most important things that we need to be aware of because the earlier we catch some of these things, the better we can intervene and and and, and raise awareness mm -hmm. and hopefully try to stop this from from happening. So share us uh, if you have any I think that you would like to share. Please go ahead. Yeah, well, um, I may not be adding some more signs and symptoms, but uh, I'm just trying to emphasize on uh, the importance of parents examining their kids always and doing it in a very friendly way so that the kids enjoy being examined by their parents. I, I want to believe that if uh, a lot of parents paid more attention to their kids, irrespective of what they originally know about the signs and symptoms, they themselves are even going to see things that are not correct mm -hmm. on the kids that can make them wonder what's happening. I can also say that uh, this also means that uh, it's important for parents to, to create a, a relationship, a constant dialogue with the kids. Make your kids want to tell you things, even when you are too busy to listen to them. May your kids always want to share their day with you and their experience with you. And also to say that parents most of the time dismiss a lot of things that kids say instead of probing, probing nicely and finding out. This is just to say is that it covers a lot about the symptoms that even if you didn't know all the symptoms, but you created this communication with your kid and you reinforce it all the time, it will be easier to, for parents yeah, that's a very good point. And we're going to talk more on uh, some of the uh, proposed solutions later on in the discussion. Where we have Delphine, she's back. Del yeah. yeah. Uh, should I take back from the question I was um, about to ask, or that was answered already? I think, uh, yeah, you can, you can carry on. We talked about signs and symptoms. Unless. Okay, unless okay so. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have anything to add before she moves on on the signs and symptoms? No, I'm fine. Okay, great. Then With the contributions okay. are okay. out already. Okay. Okay. So I was going to talk about grooming because it's also very important. And these are things that parents are actually supposed to teach their kids because when something like that starts happening around them, they have to, to inform their parents. 
Um, but before going into the group, I just want to read um, um, an extract from Manny's book. Um, she said, the first time my abuser exposed his, pen his penis to me, I was washing dishes in the kitchen. I was eight years old. I ran away and cried. He came to me, laughed, and said he was only joking. He wiped my eyes and asked me not to tell my mom because she would get upset since she would not understand that he was joking. I kept quiet and was sexually abused for the next few years. So um, that was actually part of this grooming process, right, Manny? Yes, so how, yes how, it how, was. Yeah, so can, can you please go into more details about how these perpetrators groom these children to prepare them for this horrific act? Of course. So um, obviously, I mean, I don't know if uh, everyone here, everyone watching knows, I wrote the book and the book is about my own personal experience. So this, um, I, I, uh, the character is me. So I'll speak from that perspective. It's, it's me I was talking about. It's my story I'm narrating. So um, the grooming, my grooming was quite, um, it, was, it was quite fast. Um, I think because uh, of the dynamics within our household, um there was there was a, not much communication between my parents and the children so in comes this house boy and um not only was he sort of put in a position of um, power very quickly um there was also no parental observation or no parental monitoring so so to so, so to speak as in if you delegate if you as a parent delegate or assign someone to look after your children, then you should also uh, check on them, to, to check on who, who you, you, you've assigned your children, uh, to look after your children. So because there was a lack of that, my grooming happened very quickly. So it started off, I'm going to summarize it, it started off with uh, just threatening, little threats like, why did you do this? You shouldn't do that, otherwise I'll tell your father. Then it moved on very speedily to um, things like, like holding my ear and twisting my ear, pinching me, just to see whether I'm going to report or not. And every time it was done very tactfully in the sense that uh, what he threatened me, what he threatened to report me to my parents about was something which I knew that I should not be doing. So I wouldn't, I would technically not go and report him to my parents to say he has twisted my ear or he has pinched me. So he, he, he was grooming me in a sense in order to make sure that there's, he creates that divide between the child and the parents. And that's exactly what um, how pedophiles or, or child abusers, how, that's what they do. They try to find a way to isolate the child. They will do anything they have to do to isolate the child from the parent. And so mine progressed quite rapidly. Um, I think it, it, had, it had to do with so many other factors as well. Um, and um, before I knew it, there was physical abuse. So he started beating me up. And um, from time to time, I did tell my mom in, um, in my own child kid like way um and then what happened what happened was my mom didn't necessarily follow through in the way that i would in this day and age and so that enabled the 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 house boy to continue with his grooming and that led to me being raped by him um so in essence what i'm trying to the point i'm trying to make is kind of backing up on to what um, honore said that it's very important to to establish a, a an open communication relationship with your children and it's very important to listen to them and to speak to them on a regular basis to find out what it is that they are talking about what conversations from day to day are going on between themselves and the people who are with them regularly whether it's their teacher whether it's it's a neighbor who is looking after them whether it's it's an uncle or an auntie very important for parents to to stay on top of things and think and, and ask ask the child what what did you talk about because the child might be having conversations with these people and not know that they are inappropriate conversations they have no idea because they're innocent they, they, they don't know but you as an adult if you're able to speak to this child daily and find out what conversations are going on then you'll be able to find out one example i can give is the house boy had once asked me um, if I knew what pads were, sanitary pads, and um, 
that is an inappropriate question to ask a nine-year-old. What has that got to do with him or with me? It has, it, it's, it's not necessary, it's not uh, relevant in any way whatsoever. So in that case, uh, a, a, an adult should have jumped in and squashed that immediately. And in, in my case, that was, not, that was not done. So that's the reason why, that's one of the reasons why as it progressed, I was raped for as long as I, I was. So um, that's what I would say about the grooming process. You know, I, I could go on and on about it, but it's, it's you know, it's very extensive to talk about. Uh, but grooming is literally, if I had to define it, it's literally uh, whatever the, the, the child abuser does in order to isolate the child and put them in a position in which they are uh, powerless and voiceless. That's what grooming is. Um, thank you. Um, Honore, um, saying, does any of you have anything to add on that? Um, on a very personal note, I want to applaud Mani for speaking out. And uh, I want to use this opportunity for all those listening to know that it is not a taboo to speak out. They should draw inspiration from money because we face a lot of speed breaks, especially legally, because people don't speak out. It is not a taboo. Our culture, stereotypes, and bias has made, has programmed mindsets to think it's not okay to speak out. So I'm in a very special way, I want to thank Mani for speaking out so that this should act as a booster for others to speak out, especially those mothers who conceal rape, who conceal incest. They should know that it's okay to speak out because once they don't speak out, we will not attain our objectives. Thank you very much, Mani. You're welcome, thank you. Um, thank you. So um, let, let's talk about the perpetrators, actually, the people who actually carry out this horrific act. So um, like we said earlier in the show, most um, rape and assault cases of minors are usually orchestrated by um, family members, by um, someone close to the family, someone who is trusted by the um, um, victims um, who have in the example of Mani, it was um, the house boy, and also in the book, there was also the, the, the scene of the uncle who um, also tried to, to, to sexually molest you. And like I said, I also had this personal experience. I think I was about 13 when um, I was at my uncle's house. Clear afternoon, broad daylight, everybody was in the living room watching TV, and I was sleeping, and my cousin, I was about 13, maybe then he was 40. I just felt a hand on me and somebody, you know, pressing my breast. So I was shocked. You know, you're deep in sleep and then you, I, I thought maybe I was dreaming. So I, I didn't shake. And when I realized, no, this is not a dream, this is something that's really happening, I got up, he was really massaging me and he was actually moaning, you know, like, <sighs> And he's like, shh, 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 it's okay, don't be worried. It's okay, don't be worried. And I, I quickly jumped out of the bed because uh, we were living side by side. So I just jumped out of the bed, walked out. Everybody was busy watching TV. I just walked out and went to our house and I told my stepmom. So my stepmom was really angry. She went and told his mom. And his mom just burst out crying and cried and cried and cried and apologized. And then she begged me and said, please, let it end here. Don't tell anyone. I will deal with it. And that's how it ended, wow. you know. And um, so I just want you guys to, to talk about this, this aspect of the fact that it's usually someone who's close to the family that does it. In the, in the church, we have seen it with priests that are supposed to be the most trusted people molesting young boys. So um, Honore, maybe you want to take um, have a take on this um, aspect. Why do you think um, this is the case? Yes, um, 
Chinua Achebe says in one of his books that it is the fear of hurting the the, the fear of hurting the giver that makes us eat poison. And uh, this is because sometimes we are too polite. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we are too nice. We are too nice to relatives. We are too nice to friends. But we do not, and it makes us, we, we do not respect boundaries. And uh, even when we suspect that something is going wrong, we rely on our emotion of uh, trust and closeness to that person that we do not even prop on what is going wrong. Uh, this should uh, go to parents as a very strong note. Trust no one when it comes to the safety of your child. Trust your measures and trust the training you give to your child and uh, don't trust anyone. That, that's all I would say because if we are saying that it is mostly, which is true, it's mostly people that are closest to, the, to us, to the family, that have access and are able to rape the children. It means that it's because we trust them with our children, and then the children also trust them because they see us trusting them. Mm -hmm. We are not saying that we shouldn't trust people anymore. We are saying that no matter how you trust, take, uh, keep, take the necessary precautions and maintain your policy as policy. And the children will copy that and they will know why. And also it's important to let the children know why they have to why they have to watch their boundaries. Because one thing we need to note is you can also not be around your child 24-7. But if you tell your child what the child needs to do to protect themselves, sometimes, sometimes not all the time, you can be sure that that idea is with the child 24-7, such that even if something went wrong, you would know. Um, thank you, Honore. Um, Stan, do you want to, to add something to that? I think there's something really important. It, it will go around all of you. I'm sure you have. Yes. Um, yeah. I want to say this is very sensitive, but it must be spoken. Nothing is a taboo anymore. Um, and I want to be very practical when it comes to this, especially in a Cameroonian setting. I want to say with the ongoing crisis in the Northwest and the Southwest regions, many people have relocated to Yaoundé, Douala, so most of the homes now are crowded. And this is a major, major cause of incest. Those who take into your house because you want to give them shelter, they turn around, they rape your daughter. Yeah. They rape your children. This is very wrong. I will not even call them perpetrators. I will call them predators. So we should be very careful, especially women. My second point is on economic empowerment. Women should take upon themselves to economically empower themselves because most of these cases of incest, they don't speak out because most of these perpetrators are the breadwinners of the family. So they see it as some sort of protection. If I should expose him, what becomes of taking care of these children? So it's a big problem. There is this issue of blended families. A woman gets married to a man who is not the father of the kids. Yeah. And because of these stereotypes, this bias, this patriarchy, she thinks she has to be validated by marriage. She will not expose this predator of a husband she has. Women should protect their children because even the law says it. It is the duty of the parents to protect their children from sexual abuses. So please, let's be very careful. The laws are there. Implementation is a problem, but we all have a duty to protect these children from sexual assault, from sexual molestation, whatever it be, but some form of rape, no matter what is wrong. And the way I would like to add to that, the way in which to protect the children is to make sure that we arm them 
with information and with knowledge because as Honoré rightly said earlier, we cannot be there 24 seven with the child to, to fight off any predators, we, we can't. Mm -hmm. So in the same way as you leave your house, knowing that your child is there, you teach the child, don't put your finger over that burning candle because it will burn your hand. And you leave, your, you leave the child at home knowing comf confidently that this child will not put their finger on the burning, over the burning candle. In the same way, arm them with knowledge, arm them with information. If they don't know, they don't know. Then you're, you're literally dangling your child out to predators. You need to inform them, tell them what is right, what is what is wrong. And in my opinion, in, in giving them specific examples of what is allowed and what is accepted and what is not, it's better. In, for, for example, if they are being left at home with Auntie Sarah, tell them that Auntie Sarah is not allowed to see you in the, in the, in the toilet naked. Tell them, use the Auntie Sarah's name. Don't just say generally because otherwise it's not specific. They would think Auntie Sarah is my auntie or my Auntie Sarah is my mommy's friend. So it's okay. Use specific examples. Tell them this is not this is right, this is not right. So that's what I wanted to add to that point. Please, I want to add, and when we're having at Civitas Cameroon, when we're having these trainings, sexual awareness for our kids, we tell them. You call it by its name, your vagina. Nobody touches your vagina. You, the male, you don't take your penis and you try to put it in your sister or any other girl's vagina. It's wrong. Nobody taps on your backside. It's wrong. So we say it to them as it is. And once you attain a certain age, Nobody even dates you. You bed by yourself. You use your hand for the girls. You wash your vagina to be clean. So nobody goes to that area. Whosoever goes to that area is you scream until the walls of the house come down. Mm -hmm. Sexual education for our girls, yeah. for our children, is very, very important if we have to stop this canker worm called rape. Yeah. And I am just to add to that. I, I think it's also important about the, the people because we also, when I was growing up, we always have these uncles who will come at home and and they call, oh, this is my wife, ah, my small wife, mm. ah, my small wife. That's how it started. Just last week, I had the same case here in Munich where a friend of 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 the family, and he he referred to my daughter as ah, this child, ah, the Finnish speaking don't be care. This speaking so now just say uh, this speaking now yeah go even married and self no be you and I warned him I warned him I said don't ever mm -hmm. don't ever call my child your wife my child is and he was shocked and I said no I don't like it this is how it starts mm -hmm. it starts from there yeah. don't call my child is my child if you want to say something say my child don't say my wife. She is not your wife. So, of course, I, I don't know, maybe I, if you would think I overreacted, but there were some people in the group who were like, but she's right. Why should you call her daughter your wife? I agree and with that. I agree with I your reaction. I said, yeah, I know it's a joke, but I don't want that kind of joke around my children. And I think parents should start stopping it from there because this person might come home and say, oh, my daughter, my wife, come and sit on my legs. My and then... The grooming starts, you yeah. know. So I, I think it's important yeah. that not only educate their children, but also the people around the house and tell them where their limit is, where it has to do with your children. Yeah, and if I can, yeah. just add, I just want to add two things. First, we're talking about perpetrators or pedoph pedophiles or whoever. Um, it's very important for for us to to realize that you know pedophilia is not written on anybody's forehead. Every single person is a potential pedophile. Right. Both men and women, because we are, we are, I think we are focusing more on, on girls being abused. <laughs> Young boys are equally being abused by yeah. boys or men, and even right. the women who abuse young boys. So right. let's have it, let's let's get it clear that anybody can abuse your child, whether it is your father, your husband your step uh, whatever you you know uh, uh, ex-husband your pastor your doctor 
your babysitter, anybody can abuse your child. So I think it's very important that, parents, like somebody mentioned earlier, parents should work on the parent-child relationship. I know coming from an African background, we have this tendency to make sexual education sound like, whoa, no, I can't have this education with my child. That Well, if you're not having that conversation with your child, trust me, somebody else is. Because the things we're in a digital age, there is so much in the internet, kids are exposed to all kinds of things through different apps. You have young nine-year-olds, eight-year-olds, they have cell phones. And, you know, parents give kids cell phones thinking that, they, you know, thinking that they are trying to I have the, the kids catch up with the times, you know, they are, you know, the kids are a digital or dot com or whatever you want to call these kids. But you fail to realize that there's so many that are transmitted to the child through that cell phone. And the child, of course, is exposed to so many things in WhatsApp. They belong to group chats. You know, they exchange all kinds of things and kids learn from there. So parents have make their kids feel comfortable talking about sex. That as 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 coarse and as brutal as it may sound, our kids need to feel comfortable, and it can begin as early as the age of six or you know whatever. Like that uh, 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 measurement mentioned earlier, teach them their sexual parts. Tell them what should be touched and what should not be touched. Tell them, okay, if somebody touches you here, make sure you tell me. It should be as blunt as that. There's no sugar coating this. And if we start doing that, I'm thinking, you know, I think that should help um, a little bit as well. I just wanted to add that, yeah. Can I just add something so maybe to what uh, Elizabeth said? Um, so in terms yes. of, um, in terms of, you, you mentioned uh, that anybody can, can rape your child, anyone can sexually abuse a child. Um, I just wanted to add something very little, that, which is um, that there are various categories of, um, <clears throat> of people who can who rape children? So it's it's uh, it's difficult to spot them because there's no specific profile or pattern or model that they fit into. They right. there are some people who uh, are innately they, they they have a strong arousal sexual arousal towards children, and and they actively seek out children for that reason in order to fulfill their their sexual desires. So such people would go and actively look for, for jobs in schools and wherever children are in yeah. order to be close to children. And, and, and for they, some of them even uh, sign up to become foster parents for that reason. There are others who do not have a strong arousal towards children and would not act on it unless they have the opportunity, unless the, the opportunity presents itself. So those types of people are called opportunistic offenders so mm. they only act when there's an opportunity they grab the opportunity there's also then another group of people who are one-time offenders they've done it once and they've never done it again for reasons unexplained reasons in some cases and this is based on research studies in some cases these one-time offenders would uh, rape a child and feel bad about it mainly because it was somebody who they knew, somebody, a close friend or a close a fr family friend, child, or a, fa a relative. They felt bad about it and never did it again. And then there are others who are, um, they have deviant sexual thoughts. So thoughts which, sexual thoughts which are not perceived by general society as mainstream. They're not looked at as normal sexual thoughts. For instance, there are some people who have sexual thoughts of, having sex with uh, sexual relationships with animals, some people with dead people, with corpses, and others with children. So some of these people with devi such deviant sexual thoughts would act on it, while others would never act on it. So the point I'm trying to make is, these people fit into all these different boxes. So it's very difficult to spot them. It's yeah. difficult. There might be some of the, some people who you live with who are constantly, uh, around, they just suddenly appear at the bathroom when your child is having a bath. It's suddenly, always there, always there. So it's it's easier to spot those ones. That why are you always in the bathroom? Why are you always at the room when the children are oiling themselves and stuff like that? It's easier to spot them some at times when there's that strong urge and they're constantly around the kids. But when it's a an a, an opportunistic offender, how are you going to spot them? It's difficult. So yeah. I'm saying this just to to inform to raise people's awareness about this that. It might be your 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 cousin. It might be your 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 best friend. 
and you're like, no, but they like, they really like women. They re but you don't know what their thoughts are, what they might have deviant sexual thoughts. Yeah. They yeah. might be a one-time offender who has never done it before. And, and then they f suddenly see your child walking butt naked, walking past. And then suddenly it, 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 it brings up all those um, emotions which are in them, but they will never let anybody know. They will never speak about it. So knowing this, having said this, the best thing to do is just to protect your child by informing them about these things. There's no other way. Just oh, yeah. inform them, teach them, teach them that this is wrong, this is right. Teach them that, you know, as you, as you rightly said earlier, the name, the, teach them the, the correct names of the body parts, let them know what is right to discuss and what is completely unacceptable and ensure that they come to you, they're able to come to you to speak to you uh, openly and uncomfortably. With, without fear, without any fear of of uh, that you shout at them because they have yeah. rights of being reprimanded. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's give Honore since we have him here before he disappears on us again. Honore, do you have anything to add um to what we? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah. I wanted to uh, your your contributions have uh, really uh, hit me up with the idea that I, I have a feeling that. Children are very badly left out of our of our child rape work. Uh, how do I put it? A lot of the time, the children see the parents telling them they do and they don't. But I wonder what approaches we really take to educate these children. Are we giving them just a parental hand downs on what must be done? Or how are we really involving them? Or are we thinking that they are too young to contribute to the fight against child abuse? Or are we thinking that the best way they can fight against child abuse is uh, just to, 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 to report cases to us? I'm saying this because I, I, I think that um, we can get children more involved and more engaged in the fight against child abuse. Imagine children watching children on the media saying poems, singing songs against child abuse, um, and uh, talking to each other about child abuse. If that is done, I think we'll have a very much stronger culture of peer-to-peer -peer protection, and uh, we will also be able to get deeper in the minds of the children about how best they can prevent this following the the, the, the the mind of the child. Uh, I'm just trying to say we may need to engage children more in the fight and not just think that they are a bit too young to know or to yeah. be part of the fight. Oh, yeah. uh, um, just one question to add to this particular topic before we move on to um, the risks um, factors of sexual abuse. Um, Research has shown that um, the, there's a large, large percentage of abuse of minors that's actually being carried out by adolescents. So it's not only adults who, who rape children, but we also have cases of adolescents rape, uh, raping mm -hmm. or sexually abusing um, other minors. You know, so uh, maybe this is also some kind of a, a conversation, not only to, to, to teach children how to protect themselves, but also even teaching them that it should not, like the, the perpetrators, it should not mm -hmm. even happen. Because most of them is not really like, um, it, it's some kind of an urge, an experience, you know. Oh, I want to experience this. I want to experience having sex. I want to experience uh, um, romance. I want to... To, to experience, they watch these things on TV. And um, so I think it's also important to educate, especially, um, I would say, especially our boys, because most of the rape cases that are reported are the ones done on women. So that that's the, the, the statistics uh, we have. You know, I think about 90% of cases that are reported are rape done on women and maybe about 10% cases done on men and most often 90 percent it is men raping women you know so i think it's really important to also start educating our boys from a very young age to to to, to that um no is no you know and maybe they should really refrain from even having sex until the rich, rich consenting um age 
I don't know what 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 do you say about uh, about that, uh, Manie? Yeah, I I agree. I agree completely. Um, it's very important to I I think um to edu to start educating children from a very young age about this, and uh, but it's it's even more important. It's it's very important to continue educating them throughout their their their, their, their uh, childhood, so so that when they get to the point where they are beginning, they're interested in dating or they're interested in girls and boys, um, that the education would have slightly changed, which is when you start teaching them more about healthy relationships. What does a healthy relationship look like? What does an unhealthy relationship look like? Teaching them dating tactics for for uh, teaching them uh, what uh, how why control could be detrimental to themselves and to someone else so it's it's very it's very crucial to start that education from when they're little you know when they're even when even when they're younger you can teach them you can start to teach them about boundaries which is you know for instance there was, there was a study which i read uh, in which there's uh, five five to six year old children and the teacher asked them uh, who here likes hugs when they're upset? Some kids put up their hands. And who does not like hugs? Some other kids put up their hands. And the teacher said, so how will I know if you want a hug when you are upset? How would I know whether to give you a hug or not? And the kids unanimously okay. shouted out, oh, you can ask us, which is simple. Just ask. And that's how you teach a child consent. So some people think that it's, um, it's some rocket science to teach children from that age, but it's not. You can teach them from that age, and then as they get older, the, 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 the format of teaching them changes. But if we're able to continue educating these children as they're getting older and teaching them about healthy relationships and, 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 and that kind of stuff, then it actually, in essence, prevents or reduces the number of boys and girls who then eventually become predators, sexual predators because they, it's, it's inbuilt in them by that, by that point, by adulthood. So I, I completely agree with uh, education and continuing this education as they grow. And uh, I would like to add to that point of positive masculinity. It's very important. Um, um, back home here, do, I'll always refer to our cultural background. We just focus on the girls, but... When we have uh, activities, Civitas Cameroon with children, we dwell a lot on positive masculinity because once you groom these children, these boys from the very beginning, when they're still very young to understand that some of these things like rape is very wrong, it's not acceptable, it's punishable by the law. They grow up with this and we know the, the impact of pre, uh, peer pressure. Once you train half of the boys on positive masculinity, they'll act as checks and balances in the society, especially in their schools, because now they will breed it out onto their friends and the whole concept of positive masculinity will spread on and that will reduce the whole issue of child abuse. Um, wow. Elizabeth, do you want to take the next question? Yes, let's um, let's move on to the next section, which I believe it's um, about the risk factors. Um, I know Metro Abeng spoke earlier about the environment, you know, making it conducive for acts like this to take place. You know, for instance, we have, you know, lockdowns now, and then we have, um, in the case of Cameroon, we have our family members who have left the southwest and northwest, and they are now living with uh, other family members in um, the eastern part of the country. But, you know, some of those things, yeah, they make the environment conducive. But let's, let's talk a little bit about this susceptibility. What makes, you know, a child susceptible to uh, sexual abuse? I don't know if there are any... Uh, specifics or it's more just a thing of the perpetrator being who they are. Um, Honore, if you don't mind going first, please. It's frozen. Uh oh, he's frozen. Okay, Metro, can you go ahead, please? Metro Aben. Um, in relation to that, 
our, as her earlier said, the whole family structure breeds um, all of these perpetrators, facilitates them to carry out their demonic acts. There's the issue of economic dependency. There is this thing of religious fanatism that they say the man is the head of the family, whatsoever he does is gospel. So we need to get out of all of these things. And there's this issue of silence, not speaking out. It gives these predators the confidence that we can go about raping these children and they will go scot free. But if we learn to make the environment very unconducive to them by speaking out so that they'll be able to face the wrath of justice, then we'll be able to break this chain of sexual abuse. So it's just, um, I will go again to us protecting the children because as we all know, children are very vulnerable by nature. That is why the law has the duty to protect these children. Parents have the duty, legal guardians, custodians, they have the duty. And this is where the strength of the African Charter on the right and welfare of the child comes in parental guidance. It's not just the father, mother of that child. As per mm -hmm. our customs and usages, we know once a child is born, it's not just to the father and the mother. It is to the community. So whosoever, maybe that of the parents, but you find yourself in custody of a child, you take care of a child. It is your duty to protect this child. And the law is clear on that. Once you fail in your in duties, then you can be brought before the law and you will be punished. So in a nutshell, let parents, let everybody take it upon themselves to make the environment very unconducive for these perpetrators so that they will stop molesting children sexually. Just okay. uh, to add to... Sorry, if I can now. I think we've, we've focused a lot on um, the typical nuclear family, you know, child, you know, the parent and the dependent children, right? But we, we have um, case, we have other categories of children. So we have orphans who have gone on and, they, you know, probably living with a family member somewhere and um, the orphan is being taken advantage of. That's the key thing that we, uh, we, we cannot leave out. We have kids that are being taken advantage of by virtue of their, you know, their status at, the, at, at that time, their vulnerability, and um, by virtue of the fact that they are solely dependent. I think you talk about economic dependence. They are solely dependent on whoever the perpetrator is. If they, if they don't, if they don't succumb to their their demands, then they get thrown out of the house. In the case of an orphan, for instance. They get thrown out of the house or they don't get their fees paid and all of that. So we have predators or sexual abusers who take advantage of those classes of, 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 of kids, of children. I think that is just pure, just pure evil. I, I don't know a better word for that. So let, just so just, just to make sure we don't leave that out and make this seem like a typical nuclear family uh, you know, scenario, right? Mm -hmm. But um, go ahead, Manny, if you want to add uh, something. And then Thank you. Oh, hopefully Honoré is not going to disappear again, and then he will... Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> so I was I was just going to add um to to uh, what Nsen said that uh, yes there are and you've actually touched on it now Elizabeth um that there are those who are at at high risk of um, sexual abuse are those who are homeless um or uh, are even foster, foster children. And um, those who I, I, those who have um, learning disabilities or are disabled or are vulnerable mm -hmm. in, in, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And not just that, even in households where the parents themselves have mental health problems, so they're, they're not able to take care of themselves. So obviously, directly and indirectly, it will affect the children's well-being. <laughs> And so that in itself puts the children in, in a, a position of, of being at risk of sexual abuse from, from outsiders or people who come to the house. Um, yeah, so that's what I, I wanted to add quickly. Yeah, honorary, uh, yeah, please. Yes, yes, I am 
I am going so I'm enjoying your I'm enjoying your input so much uh, that I'm, I sometimes forget that I have to contribute. I feel like I'm watching the show too. So, <laughs> but, but I, I want to add that, or uh, just to reiterate that building self-esteem is so important because one of the strongest weapons of the perpetrator, especially repeat perpetrator, is intimidation and threats. Mm. And so. There is a way you bring up a child and the child feels that the child is beyond even intimidation. And one of the things that we need to do is to get the child, not only to dialogue with the child, but to also believe that, uh, make the child know that they are always protected by us and that we are on their side all the time. If we keep showing children for every little thing we do wrong without, without holding them close to us, then, the day they get raped, they will even think they have done something wrong. So it's like we need to really build their self-esteem in a way that, one, they cannot be easily intimidated. And then we also need to build trust in a way that they know that we are out to protect them and we are not shunning them for everything that goes wrong. Nice, nice input. Um, so Delphine, do you want to carry on or...? I'm just going. Yeah, so um, somebody just, if, while we are on this, somebody um, asked a question in the forum, uh, and I think the question is directed to me. You talked about, um, you know, having uh, structures in place in to protect children. Do we, are, are people aware, because they want you to have, um, somebody is echoing, if you have another device on, switch it off. Okay. So, I, I, because it's one thing to have laws and regulations and, and rules in place and policies, and there's another thing for people to be aware that these things are in place in Cameroon. If the issue doesn't occur and, and you know, it, it turns into a legal battle, most, most oftentimes, you know, the case just dies a natural death, right? So, somebody asked in the um, in the forum if people are aware of these structures that are in place to protect kids. And if, if they're aware, what can be done for this awareness to reach the right audience? Yes, um, Elizabeth, as you rightly said, uh, in Cameroon, we have a plethora of laws. The laws are really effectively there, but there is the issue of efficient implementation. Because here, yeah, we are good at ratifying international instruments, very good at that. But once we do it, we forget about it. They just stay there and there is no implementation. Even our national laws, yeah. There are structures in place, like the Ministry of Social Affairs. But again, um, Cameroonians should be aware because they say ignorance of the law is no excuse. They should go an extra mile to be able to cultivate that attitude of reading. And legal literacy is very important. Like if your child is molested, sexually molested, you don't even know where to start from. Just go to the Ministry of Social Affairs. Yes, it's true that um, it's not the best, but at least it is there. You put your, your, your worries there, you complain there, and at least you should have a report as to that. And again, that is where civil society comes in now. Once you face difficulties with these government institutions, that is why civil societies act as watchdogs. Civil societies are there for the promotion of human rights of this children. If you know that you will not have that propensity to go through the normal legal channels, just go to a, an NGO, for example, Civitas Cameroon, where we deal with prom protect, promotion of human rights. Just talk to them and they'll take upon themselves to see into it that this child who has been sexually molested get justice that is duly deserved because the laws are there. But if you are not aware, go yeah. through somebody, yeah. go through a channel that will 
enable you to have this justice. So, and even the government, they say there is a hotline, 116, that you can call to access them when a child is being sexually molested. Yeah, it is there on paper. But how many times will you call and somebody will even pick up the phone? Yeah. So those yeah. are some of the frustrations that people face and you see it's like the will of justice is not turning. But I would like to say that this, my fellow Cameroonians, if you are faced with such a problem of sexual molestation and you think you're having some speed breaks, contact Civitas Cameroon, contact a couple of other civil societies, NGOs, and talk to them, and they will ensure that that predator out there, that perpetrator out there is brought to book. Because once you let them out there, the chain continues. It's yeah. not just about your daughter. It's about a whole dynasty of our girls. Yeah. So we yeah. must be able to go an extra mile to see into it that these perpetrators are brought to face the world of justice. Mm -hmm. So if the system is a little bit complicated, just go knock at the door of any civil society and mm. you explain your problem to them. Most of them, like Civitas Cameroon, they will do it pro bono because mm. there's the issue of finances that is killing us. Government is supposed to put in place funds that will help these victims to be able to go through the justice system. The legal aid is there, but it's so cumbersome. But Thank God for civil society yeah. Yeah. to take upon themselves, no matter the hustles of no funds, but they will still go an extra mile to provide services to these individuals who are in need of services. So let's not give up on the system. Let's not give up upon ourselves. Let's form this chain, this teamwork that we can come together together, bring our resources together, our mindsets together to help the vulnerable out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very valuable information. Um, Delphine, do you want to carry on with the next yeah, question? Yeah, okay. So um, did, did you talk already about the um, how abuse impacts the child's um, development? No, that should be the next. Okay, all right. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, the next question um, will be about um, the development of the child and how um, sexual abuse impacts um, the trajectory of um, development of a minor. Uh, Mani, do you want to... Yeah, that's that. We just want to apologize. We have, we have exceeded our one-hour mark. <laughs> and if it's okay with you guys that we just take mm -hmm. a little more of your time of because course. I think it's important that we touch all this. We, we're soon coming to an end. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I am um, basically when a child is, uh, is raped or sexually abused, it can literally ruin the child's life. It uh, takes away, it, it, it eradicates their, their adulthood, technically. Um, it has massive uh, massively adverse effects on the child's development. Um, I can speak from personal experience and from the, my experience of working with kids who have been sexually abused. Um, the, it has very, very huge impact, a huge impact on your mental health. Um, many people go into a deep depression, which lasts for years and years. It can last for years and years. There's also the issue of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, some people develop anxiety, which lasts for years. Um, some people for the rest of their lives, especially if they, they're unable to get any form of therapy or support for it. Uh, many people commit suicide. Uh, and then it also has effects on their sexual development. It uh, it, it affects the, the uh, Honore mentioned earlier. It, it affects their self-esteem, their confidence. As in, basically, you're you're growing because you were you were abused as a child, uh, as a child. And many many children are abused at a time when they have not even begun to develop their coping mechanisms. So they're growing up 
and um, and and they've been violated in such a horrible way, and uh, they they grow up not feeling lost really, and um, many people have a disconnect between uh, in in their lives. So you you feel like you 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 feel out of place, so to speak, and it, that all those things take many many years to to first of all identify, uh, because some people do not realize they're not able to uh, uh, associate those aspects about themselves to the, the rape. So they don't even realize that they're, they're related. So you have to, first of all, get to the point where you realize that this is, I'm, I'm this way because I was raped as a child. And then after that, accepting it to yourself, acknowledging it, and then even deciding, getting to the point where you're even able to go and get help or even knowing where to get help from. So it literally messes your whole life up, to be honest. And um, only very few people are lucky or fortunate to, to be in a position mm -hmm. where they, uh, they're able to realize that, uh, realize why they have those issues, whatever issues they are, and, and then get help for them. So uh, it's 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 just to say, you know, child rape is is just it's horrible. It's um it's really horrible because of the fact that it is preventable. It is preventable. People do not realize that it is preventable, and um and the fact that they they do not prevent children from it, and then compared to or compared to the 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 after effects of the child abuse, it's it's just it's just horrid. So uh, the best thing is just to please let's carry on trying to prevent to prevent child abuse and um, so as to prevent a child from having to uh, face such turmoil in for the rest of their life in many cases. Okay, thank you. I think you you really basically touched most of um, most of the 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 Point. impact of um, sexual abuse to a child and because of time we just need to go on to the next section i'm sure we'll not talk about all questions um tonight but i can already see the energy is kind of <laughs> you know getting down so i, I want us to, to really look at uh at the cameroon society right i think um sen you already talked about the law and and what the law in Cameroon, um, maybe part of it, maybe not all of it, but um, what does the law in Cameroon say about child um, sexual abuse and how effective has it been applied? As I earlier said, the laws are there, uh, but I want to start from something that is very important because uh, there is a nuance in our legal system. First and foremost, it's good to understand who a child is because if you cannot understand who a child is then you cannot have justice for that child so um as per our laws there is this um discrepancy because some of the laws we talk of um a child being 15 while others will talk of 18 so it is um, something that has to be addressed. So I will take it from there. For example, the penal code of Cameroon will talk of 18 years, and then you have the um, law on statutes of persons, it will talk of a child being 15. So more often than not, there is that uh, issue, that conflict. So most people will not understand exactly the age at which a child is actually considered a child to come under the, the, the provisions of rape. But again, as um, law prevails uh, per our constitution, Article 45, it's very clear that international instruments override national laws. And Cameroon has ratified a couple of these international instruments, like the Convention of the Child. So it puts the age at 18, there is the African Charter, the right and welfare of the child, it puts it at 18. There is even said that it puts it at 18. So from there, it is very clear that in Cameroon, a child is anybody who is below the age of 18. 
and then we'll look at that um the law too is clear there you when when you look at the penal code there are sections there that specifically addresses sexual offenses when it comes to children there is section 295 it talks on private indec indecency i'll not get into it as i said we need to cultivate the 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 the, the culture of reading so we should be able to go online type the Cameroon penal code and we have the provision so there i'll just be to guide you people there is the rape section 296 which is punishable and i want to come to a point here that we mentioned um religious figures that rape children i want it to be very clear today i want to tell my fellow brothers and sisters cameroonians that it is an aggravating circumstance once a religious authority rapes a child the punishment is doubled mm -hmm. and the section 297 it talks on uh, consent of marriage there is act of bondage section 2342 that's when uh, parents actually take their children their girls and give them to early marriages child marriages because they owe that man some money and they think that by giving that child into a marriage when the child is not even of age they pay, they pay their debt it's very punishable by law there is indecency to child so there's a plethora of laws there that if we want to go by the books in cameroon sexual molestation is very punishable and i want to conclude by going into section 360 which is on incest it says it clearly it is punishable by the law. Incest is not something that is acceptable. If you come up with any form of incest, the judicial system of Cameroon is very, 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 very clear on the protection of human rights of these children by punishing all of these malfunctions. Mm. And go again, it will it will not do us justice if we don't talk about the current um ongoing armed conflict in the Northwest and the Southwest region. Following this armed conflict, children, as I say, are very vulnerable. They have become victims of sexual molestation from both parties of the conflict. And yeah. it is very clear, even following international humanitarian law, the Geneva Conventions are there. So, all of these sexual acts, sexual molestation of children, especially during armed conflict, is punishable. Because even if we go by the popular UN resolution 1325 on conflict, it says that states have the duty to protect children and women during an armed conflict. We have national, um, regional governments, the Maputo and all were not that is for protection of this right. So let's not give up. Laws are so, there. Yeah, let, 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 let me let me interject a little bit there. I know with Cameroon, every we have we have we have a law for everything in Cameroon. It's one thing to have yeah. law, and it's 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 an, an entirely different thing to those for those laws to be implemented to the point that people actually get results because there are many cases where. People just don't bother to report these cases because they're like, why I even get a waste my time? Because exactly. the traitor or the molester will go bribe Chandam or bribe uh, the other lawyer or bribe the magistrate and get away with it. I think it's not so much about what laws are in, play, in place. It's about implementing those laws. And the, uh, until we start seeing the system implementing these laws and bringing these perpetrators to book all what you're saying here to me is just ice uh, quite uh, yeah yes, because there's a lot of everything sound, in fact we have laws more than nigeria it could, nigeria, sound as such. it could sound as such but i want to differ that it's a little bit overriding the whole purpose because the laws are there implementation is a problem but right. it doesn't overrule the fact that those who are steadfast <coughs> to see to it that these perpetrators are brought to book they will normally have their results 
So in your experience of boy ono cases of sexual assault, okay. and these perpetrators are behind bars as okay. we speak now. Very I will not acknowledge okay. the fact that Cameroonians should be defeated by that mindset that right. we have institutions <clears throat> that not function. I would say no to that. Okay. They must be steadfast. That is why I'm talking and insisting on legal literacy. They okay. should know. They should not give up. They should go to the right quarters and they will have justice. It's not a fallacy. It's not a window dressing. The point is, Cameroonians should be able to know where to knock, to know mm -hmm. how they can, to know who can actually walk the walk with them in this mm -hmm. judicial system yeah. so that justice will prevail. And I will insist again, there are many, many lawyers out there, seasoned lawyers in Cameroon that even if these families, they don't have money, once it's child abuse, they take mm. it upon themselves pro bono and they mm. follow the law. Nobody is above the law. So the issue of corruption, it depends on which door you knock. It depends right. on which civil society you go to meet. I want to assure you that the laws are there, and once they are banned, implementation is not a problem. They will have justice. That's Thank very, you. very good. Yeah, that's, that's very that's good to know because to me, quite honestly, I've, you know, in other, other domains, of course, I've had issues where, you know, I could have taken it a step further, but I was like, you know, why even? What's the point? Yeah. So it's very yeah. important. No, we cannot work with the system. Yeah. We cannot. We have a role to play. We yeah. all have a role need to see that's what i'm talking about this is where networking comes in as well right, right. Yeah. Talk, talk, talk. networking yeah. so that people can know exactly where they can knock and they will have the requisite justice which is required perfect it's perfect. not a long so um to our audience i will i will try to get the names of all of these um civil societies from um um Barry Sansen and also some of the lawyers who, who will be able to help um, families and um, in cases of child rape. So I'll get all this information. I will post them on the debate um, Facebook site. So if you get yeah. there, we are on Instagram and we are on Facebook. You will get this information on our pages. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Barrister. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. It's really um, a positive thing. I think so, um, yeah. mm -hmm. Having positive results in laws actually implemented in the country because, like Eli, I've all also been very um, demotivated and um, disillusional when it has to do with anything legal in Cameroon. Yeah. So yeah. it's good to hear something, something like that. And mm -hmm. I think it's also, um, you know, some kind of re um in the horizon for, for for families who are, who are being affected by stuff like this okay then let, let's move to this very big topic of pedophilia because um that's something that's really very common in the cameronian society um it's a very common practice um <clears throat> this notion of sugar daddy where men 30, 40, and above go about chasing young girls, sometimes even minors, and if below the, um, the, the the age of consent, to have relationships with them. So, um, and according to the law, having sex with a minor, and even if it is with consent, is illegal. But nobody seems to care, as you know, it's a society that has normalized sex between old men and young women, sometimes minors, and um, breeding a culture where girls are seen as providers of sexual um, gratification um, to men. So what do you think about, oh, so um, Honore is not there. I wanted to, to, to give him this question first. But no, uh, anyway, um, so what, what do you think about this and how can we as a society protect our children um, from such practices? 
I, yeah, I, I believe that this um, it, it's this issue of uh, sugar, the sugar daddy culture and all that, it's multifaceted and it's very difficult to, I guess, sweep away or, or solve in with, with a magic wand because there's the issue of poverty, you know, there's there are girls out there who have no other means of getting money and then they have all these uh, people who, uh, um, men who are uh, willing, very willing to provide you with whatever you want, school fees or dresses or whatever it is they want. Just, and, and it's for, for simple favors because they consider them simple favors, it's nothing. And because it's, it's, it's being viewed as nothing, it's, uh, well, the reason why it's being viewed as nothing is because it has been normalized. It's looked upon as normal. That's the that is the thing to do. If you if if you are not doing it, you're sometimes viewed by your peers as what's wrong with you. Isn't that what everybody is doing? So it's so normal now that even uh, that that has perpetuated the a rape culture, so to speak. It it that's what it's perpetuated, and it it doesn't even look like it's an issue because. Everyone is doing it. It's normal. It's it just seems to me like it will carry on. Like why would it stop? Who are who who are we to come come in and try to mess this up? It, the the system is working. You give me a sexual sexual favor and you get what you want. So there's there's poverty everywhere. People don't have jobs. You finish from university and if you're even able to finish from university, because even in university you're giving sexual favors to the lecturers for the grades and and, and marks in order to pass. So it's a vicious cycle which has been there for years, and uh, I think it will it will take a lot from the top, especially to change it because people are in very grim and dire situations that of poverty that uh, they they see this as the only option for them. It's the only option. So uh, it, it's a very grim and sad uh, situation because I, I believe that I don't think anybody really would want to be in that situation, but you find yourself in that situation and that's the only thing you can do. So it becomes normal. It's not, it's not a sexual abuse anymore. It's not, it's not, technically it's not that because it's normal, it's the way of life. So yeah, I think it will take many, many years of, of uh, trying to change things from the bottom up and from within communities to, to, to get to make a change to this. Thank you. Um, um, I would like to just add, like, um, trying to situate what we're saying in relation to our topic, sexual abuse and these pedophiles. So there is once it's a child, the issue of consent doesn't come up because a child cannot give consent as to right. a sexual mm -hmm. relationship. So pedophiles mm -hmm. and uh, sexual abuse, when it comes to minors, it's consent is just out of the question. It's just an issue of this what i hear now is trendy do they call it slay queens it's rather unfortunate that our children girls below 18 think that they have to be slay queens most of them slay queens and coming being able to be that trendy they have to go about having sexual intercourse with these sugar daddies. So it's just something in us being able to inculcate in our girls that issue of discipline, that issue of just wipe away the issue of materialism from them. You see a child now, a girl below 16, 18, is talking of iPhone, what, what, what. I, I don't even know about those trendy iPhones. It's just about materialism and all these pedophiles, more often than not, they will say they are men or women who are mentally sick. That if you want to ask me, majority of them, they're not mentally sick. They're just predators out there to destroy these girls. So as to pedophiles, it's very punishable by the law. And once it's established that it's a mental impediment, then there are institutions where they're supposed to be not out there. Let them go to Santo Jamode and they should be there because that's where mentally sick people are. So the honors is back on us to be able to educate our girls that all this issue of materialism, it's not of essence. And the law is going to punish this pedophilia. Yeah, I'm not even going to go into this issue of mental illness because I think <laughs> our folks back there are beginning to, you know, 
do exactly what the West people out in the West are doing and mental illness as mm -hmm. a rationale or reason to to get away with you know the most of them yeah yeah so mental illness to me that's far fetched this is um, we are in we are in Africa here we don't know mental illness in Cameroon <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, let's uh, please. Let's move on to the last uh, part of the discussion. I know we've already talked, we've already talked about that quite lengthily. Um, you know, during the course of the discussion, you know, some of the solutions that we can uh, put in place to curb or, if possible, um, eradicate this issue of sexual abuse in minors. So, Honore, if you don't mind, please, um, you know, let's just do a roundtable. We we'll each take turns and and talk about solutions that you think should be in place or that we could implement to to take it to help us fight this oh uh, yes uh, thank you i'm sorry about my my connection i'm in bamenda so i'm talking from ground zero um now uh, hoping that the internet doesn't get me my i'll just say this as my last word I, I pray that um, the fight against child rape goes to Erin Jangi House. It should not end in CBO and seminars and the big debate. It should go to women's groups. We should have all the Catholic, Presbyterian, Baptist women talking about child rape. We should have uh, market women talking about it. Jangi groups, veteran clubs, men's clubs, children's clubs, Sunday school. I mean, Topics like this should make it into women's manuals, church manuals. Topics like this should be discussed everywhere that it matters, in the slums, in the streets, villages, because maybe we are even getting documentation from families that are more educated. A lot happens in the areas uh, where we they don't even have access to all these things we are talking about. We need to reach out. We need to reach deep. That's, that's all I can say for now. And... Please, if I disappear, don't mind. I just want to see this topic everywhere now, everywhere possible. I agree. I agree with that. Um, and uh, I think for my last words would just be to uh, I, I just summarize what we've all said, that uh, child sexual abuse is a, is a crime and um, it should be uh, the, the system. We, have, we need a system in place which comes out explicitly and says that this is a crime because without that everyone people who are abusing children will carry on because it's not being explicitly said openly and loudly for everyone to see and to hear that it is a crime and that this is a crime so it and it's punishable by this this is the punishment people are not aware people are not held accountable and so it continues and we're just hurting our children so that those will be my last words for this Okay, um, yeah, it's your turn. Um, my, I would like to, my last word will come in the form of recommendations. So to yeah. better our legal system so that um, things can get better because Cameroon is not a jungle. <laughs> I would like to say um, it is high time there should be, um, the family code should be adopted. I would like to say awareness should be far more reaching to especially the royal areas and then programs related to child rights are mostly NGOs should do a lot more sensitization and then there should be creation of mechanisms that can bring children together so that they themselves will be ambassadors of this change they themselves will be able to speak up and the change will come about so I just want to conclude that the laws are there we shouldn't give up. We should come up, speak, and then we'll have justice. Thank you. And, and for your colleagues, one word for your colleagues. <laughs> for my colleagues? Yeah. My colleagues, um, especially barristers of uh, common law, we yeah. shouldn't give up. We are very, very seasoned lawyers. So we should do everything possible to see into it that all of these victims of child molestation, they should be able to have justice so that we yeah. can ensure that 
our society regains the lost confidence in the judicial system. It is our duty to provide them with solutions and we will not relent. Yeah, thank you very much, Thea. And I think, yeah, and we talked about the family, uh, the parents. I think we as parents, we owe our children that responsibility to ensure that we have that relationship with them, um, that they can trust us to the point that they can confide in us. And not only confiding in us, but when they tell us, when they confide in us and they tell us some of these things, we should believe them. Yes, because that's another thing too, because uh, we have that tendency to say, no, my brother, I cannot do that to you. No, 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 no. Like we said earlier, pedophilia is not written in anybody's forehead. If, if we've gotten to the stage where even, 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 even the church, even, even men of God are abusing children, then imagine what people who have no, um, people who, who really have nobody or no being that they think they are responsible to in terms of the way they act and behave would, would, would act. So um, it's very important that parents uh, please um, pay attention to children, to move them and take action. Um, I think that's all I have for uh, Delphine. Yeah. So um, I will give my last word by reading another um, excerpt from Manya's book. Um, this is also um, a rape scene um, and it starts like this. Um, she, she was, she did something that Uncle George was angry about and um, she was, I will never report you again. Please, Uncle George, I made a mistake and I'm sorry for telling Tata Marie. While I was speaking, he sat next to me at the edge of the bed, still smiling. Have you finished? I nodded. You are a child, so I forgive you. You hear? I nodded and thanked him, then he continued. But when somebody does anything very bad, they have to be punished. I will give you your punishment, so you will never ever talk to me with that big mouth again. He got up on top of me and raped me annually. It is real. Sexual abuse to the child is very real. It happened in our houses. It happened in our bedrooms, in our kitchen, in our bathrooms. It happened in our schools. It happened in our churches. It is very real. Please, parents, talk to your children. And like Elizabeth said, listen to them. We know it is true. Sometimes children tell stories. Children have a very rich fantasy. That is true. Sometimes they make things up. But shit like this, if your child comes up to you and tell you anything, because I know Manny tried to tell her parents once and they didn't believe her. They believed Uncle George and they gave him more rights over her. The rape continued. So please listen to your children. Watch your children closely, teach them, talk to them, and listen to them. That's just the message I can pass to everyone out here. And I would definitely recommend you all to read this book. It's on Amazon called Cactus in a Calabash. It teaches you so much the do's and don'ts of rape and how to um, maybe get help through therapy and yeah. how to get help. In, um, in a situation of rape. So not only child rape, if you have ever been raped, even as an adult, it will still help you. So just get a copy and get it for your girls, get it for your sons, and please also teach your boys. Someone put a comment before, um, it's time to start um, training our boys. So um, teach them, give them, all, not only your girls, but also teach your boys lessons on sexuality and um, sexual relationships with women. And when, they, when, when someone says no, it is a no. It's not trying to play, you know, being difficult to get. Just take it as a no and go. So um, yeah, that's, that's my last word for, 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 for today. I want to thank you all so much. It's been an amazing discussion. It's been an amazing conversation, very educative. I learned a lot today. I got some a little glimpse of hope in the fact that um, we can even trust our legal institution in Cameroon. Thank, you. Thank <laughs> you for that. Yeah, yeah. And, um, 
Elizabeth, thank you so much um, for co-hosting. Um, Honoré is unfortunately gone. I want to thank Honoré. Um, Honoré, just... <laughs> thank you so much. Because honestly, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say this because it is important. It was yes. very difficult for us to get a meal on the show today. Yeah. It was really difficult. Okay. All the guys we reached out to, some accepted, and then a day or two later, they came back and said, no, I don't think I would want to talk about this. It's a very sensitive issue. I don't yeah. want to raise a backlash on social media. So really? Men are not comfortable talking about this <laughs> on, 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 in the public. So when Honoré came up, Honoré just signed in last night. So guys, that's why you don't have him on the flyers. So, Honoré, thank you very much. Really courageous of you yeah. to come up and talk with us. And um, you've been really, really helpful in this conversation. And I just hope that more men will also come out and talk publicly mm -hmm. about um, sexual abuse yeah. of children, of women, of men. Yeah. So, um, and thank you very much for that. Mani, thank, thank you. you. You've been Thank you. you're really courageous that you come out and speak openly about something that happened to you, something that mm -hmm. our culture see as shame. A lot of people will not come out because they will think they will be they will be marked, you know, mm -hmm. and there will be this stigma yeah. on there. But you know, you, you came out and, and, and you, you you told your story, and that's mm -hmm. important. You you you, you 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 know, you, you you spoke, you let your voice be heard. And that, I think that's already one defeat or the main defeat to, pet yeah. or, uh, to sexual predators mm -hmm. when you speak out mm -hmm. because your voice is your biggest tool. It's the mm -hmm. only thing that you have that was. So thank you very much for sharing this experience with us and thank you very much for your book. I, I, I enjoyed it, I cried and uh, it, it, it brought so many emotions. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you you actually encouraged me to talk about my own personal um, sexual abuse. I, I never talked about this before. Really? I never okay. told anyone, you know. But after yeah. reading your book, I started mm -hmm. telling people. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you for being an inspiration. And barista, <laughs> thank you, thank you. You 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 were on fire today. You were on thank fire. <laughs> If I should meet Barry as an opponent in court, she's going to slaughter me. So, um, thank you very much. You are an inspiration as well. And um, yeah, I can just only say thank you. And thank you to our viewers for keeping up with us for so long. I know we took a little bit more time, but it was really important that we have this conversation and we're calling on everyone if you've ever been sexually abused if your child has ever been sexually abused do not be afraid speak up because that's the only way we're going to defeat this enemy by speaking up by coming out by telling our stories do not speak do not be ashamed no one is going to shame you no one the only person that they're going to shame is the person who did this despicable act. So okay. come out, tell yeah. your story, let oh, your yeah. voice oh, yeah. be the, 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 the captain mm -hmm. of your life. Mm -hmm. Don't let it defeat you. You should defeat it. So thank you very much. And um, Elizabeth, if you have anything to say. No, I'm good. I think you've said it all. I thank you guys so much. Thank you for the day. Um, I know how the challenges in Cameroon when it comes to the internet and light, and we really appreciate the fact that uh, you know you braced yourself and you decided to join this uh, conversation. So you don't an all woman affair. Um, you know, men are or boys are equally a bit much as a girl. So it's um, from the middle, you know, from the, your your from your your gender, uh, Manny, you know. Heads up, hands up. I'm going to get your book and I'm going to recommend your book to others. And um, I really think you're a great role model. And I, I pray that you don't stop, you know, here or wherever you are. Just keep moving and make this your prerogative, your priority, and make sure that the word gets out there. I mean, you're a beautiful woman. You look 
Well, there's no reason why, <clears throat> sorry, I have, uh, there's no reason why any child should try to, you know, keep this as a, an, an experience as such as a secret of fear of shame of any sort. No, that that's long past. We are way past that um, that uh, that era when we 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 we, we place the taboo on things like this. So, in fact, you know, I I admire your your courage, and I pray that you continue to speak up for you know the, you know victims and. Potential victims, and for you, Metro, I love your tenacity. I just love because I was trying to push you to see how far you can. I think back really hard, so I'm very happy about that because the Cameroon system is just, you know, of course, what it is, and um, and I'm glad to see that uh, you know people like you are able to take up pro bono work in domains like this and make sure that these perpetrators are brought, you know, they are brought to to justice. So. Okay. Thank you everybody for having us tonight and we're also glad to have you tonight so hopefully we'll chat some other time thank yeah. you thank you, thank you. So, okay thank you. And, uh, i know today we talked about only about sexual abuse on minors of course there are different other kind of abuse on minors we have like the physical abuse we have children that are being used as slaves in house to do house calls so we're also going to have another show on this other different kind of abuses on children um we will set this up and we'll set up and put the date on our big debate page so um we'll also sometime in the future have another um show on um sexual abuse on adults you know so um just just keep watch on our page and you'll get all this information so thank you guys wish you all a wonderful night elizabeth you still have day <laughs> so yes. wish you a nice day and um a nice weekend ahead thank you bye-bye thank, thank you, you. bye